Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite fields, theorems, algorithms, whatever it is, I lost track anyway, um, but it's still a very, very biased collection. So today I actually want to tell you a story of a failure or of, of myself and my failure to understand why iterations are good. So um, if you don't know what an iteration is, an iteration is the following. So let's say you want to move a box from A to B, huh? But the box is very heavy because you're weak like me. So you just lift the box, you move it one meter, and then you realize it's way too heavy for you. So you put it down again. Ah, well, you're still not a B, but you lifted it one meter. So you start over again. You lift the box, you move forward, maybe a half a meter now, and it's still too heavy for you. So you move it down and I left it down. And then you start again, pick it up, move forward one quarter, not one quarter, one third of a meter. Uh, and so on. So um, whatever, one plus one over two, plus one over three, whatever, and so on. And this diverges, so you eventually get to where you want to go. Beautiful. It might take you a while, depending where B is, but you eventually get there. And you have just discovered an iterative method. Because you have a function, which is like taking the box, picking it up, moving it forward. And it takes an input, namely your starting position, and gives you an output, well, the position where you put it down and you just apply that function over and over and over again where your new input is your old output and that's an iteration and that's iteration in mathematics so we can actually finish here well, we understand how it works or i could go on and give you a real math example um maybe let's do that but please keep the box moving example in mind because i, I feel like i like that one okay so again there's a standard iteration method or the the prototypical iteration method um, is Newton's method, which of instead of explaining it in formulas what it does, I will just open Google and show you an animation in a second. But let's let's just uh, discuss it a little bit. So Newton's method is a root finding method. You will see that, and it is kind of the prototypical example of iteration. And even better, it converges fast. So essentially, um, you want to know the root numerically and the accuracy kind of doubles uh, with the number of steps. So it's pretty good. So it's some, some pot, uh, square type thing. Um, and let's now have a look whether we can actually understand what Newton's method is. So let's see. So what would I do if I don't know what Newton, Newton's method is? I would put Newton's method and I would find uh, Newton's method here to just uh, open it. And I would hope the best. I zoom in so you can see it better. And I would hope that they have some animation that explains what's going on. Um, and, oh, they do. There you go. So you start somewhere. There you go. Just takes a slope and you have a new input point. Start somewhere, takes a slope, you have a new input point, right? It's an iteration. Start somewhere. This is like putting the box and whatever. And you converge towards the solution. And you can somewhat call that the gradient method, like you go into the direction of the steepest gradient, so where it goes down the furthest, because you want to kind of find the root. Thing. But anyway, this is how it works. Um, and I realize now that this is in German. Didn't I just use the English Wikipedia? Anyway, Funktion und Tangente, in case you don't know. Uh, anyway, let's run it once more. You start somewhere, you take the tangent, the, well, the slope of the point, and you get a new point to start, and so on, and so on, and so on. And you will eventually, actually pretty quickly, uh, go to um, back to the road. It's a pretty cool algorithm, right? It's kind of pretty cool. So uh, that's something you learn very early on in your studies. Some people might have seen it in school, but it depends where you uh, go to school. And I never questioned this method. I thought it was pretty good, actually, because I feel like finding the root of a general function is um, pretty difficult. You know? So I, I think this is kind of a nice method. But then it somehow hit me at one point. Because people were studying iterations for methods where I can just write down the solution without approximating it. And I got very confused why anyone would do that. So in order to avoid further confusion, let me tell you why would we do this. Huh? And let me give you an example of something where I thought actually there should be just an exact, exact algorithm that I run. And I'm happy with that. So let's say you want to solve a system of n linear equations. Um, you can do that exactly. That's it's essentially is equivalent to matrix multiplication. Or, or that's that's a fun story. Uh, oh, cool. let's do this live. So matrix multiplication, 
multi I don't need to spell correctly, it doesn't matter. Matrix multiplication, wonderful. Um, how to multiply matrices, that's not what I want. Maybe what I want is complexity, something like that. Ah, beautiful. Complexity of matrix multiplication. And there, I think there was some nice diagram of, yeah, beautiful, that's what I was looking for. So complexity of matrix multiplication, and this is the exponent, or oh, let me just write it down. Um, so this should be some n to something, alpha or something. And the, what you see here on Wikipedia is the exponent and how it was pushed down over the years. So that's a famous, uh, kind of the first step was done to st by Strassen and then it goes down and down and down. And nowadays it's roughly around, uh, let's say 2.4. So matrix multiplication is roughly n to the 2.4. So a little bit faster than a parabola and a little bit slower than a cubic. So naively you would just have uh, n cubed operations. And I must admit that I kind of stopped here, so I don't know what this is. I'm pretty sure I should know, but I don't. Um, so anyway, doesn't really matter for today. Uh, the only thing that matters is essentially solving linear equations is a, it's kind of an equivalent problem to matrix multiplication. Just think about, you just multiply the equation by the inverse of the matrix. I can just actually just do that for you. So whatever you want to solve, a uh, x equals b. So if you know you want to know x, so if you know the inverse of a, you can just solve it, right? So kind of a matrix multiplication problem. Okay, and the point is, and that's why I get got very confused, the exact algorithms to do that, right? and then whatever, you do some kind of matrix decomposition, you find an inverse, something like that, and you multiply it. And you can do that pretty fast. Right? I thought this is pretty good. And let's say n cubed, and let's say n squared, which is a little bit easier for calculation. But actually, if you really think about it, well, look at this nice picture here. So here's n, rows of n, and here's n squared. n squared just shoots out like, 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 wah, like fuck. So n squared is actually not that great. In particular, if you really want to multiply large, large, large matrices, okay? Not, we're not talking about a two by two matrix that you want to multiply, but maybe you have a neural network with a millions of parameters or billions of parameters like ChatGPT, and a neural network is essentially matrix multiplication and parameters are essentially the entries of matrices. So uh, there are a lot of large matrix multiplications going on. And then an O of N squared is actually not that great, right? So uh, a thousand by thousand matrix already needs a million operations. Mm, it's not, not, that's not that great. Um, fine, okay. But the real problem, the real problem comes into the following thought and I completely ignored that for a long time. The real problem with an exact algorithm is that you lose everything you've spent on to time and resources and memory or whatever you've spent into the exact algorithm um, if you have to kind of quit the calculation before it's finished. And it might just be because you're running out of memory or whatever. Some, you, usually you don't quit the calculation yourself, but maybe there's some reason you need to or it stops, right? So everything is lost if it stops. And I had this issue so many times in my career that I had a calculation running for whatever, 24 hours on a funny server and then eventually it says I'm running out of memory. So everything is then lost. It's a very annoying thing. And that was, until it happened to me, I was not aware that this is actually a thing. Well, let me just say that again. An exact calculation, fantastic, but it needs to finish, right? So if you have something really large, then whether it really finishes is a little bit of a tricky question and you get nothing if it doesn't finish. And this is where the iteration comes in, right? So, okay, maybe I can't move my box from A to B. Maybe I can't do that. Maybe I can just go to B, B over two or something. But in iteration, I can stop it at any time essentially and still have some output, yeah? In my Newton, in my, sorry, my Newton, in Newton's method, uh, Maybe I don't get very close to the, but if I just do it one, two, three, four, five times or whatever, I can choose it and I'm still converging towards uh, the solution. And that's really the power of iteration in my, my point of view, my bias point of view nowadays, because as I said, it happens very often to you and you have a, well, for some people it happens very often that you have a calculation which you will not finish. And if you're up for exact calculations, yeah, that's just bad because then you get nothing out of it. And that's kind of this power of uh, iteration, essentially. And then the kind of the question changes because I can stop it at any time. 
it's not so much of a how long does it need to run in computation a uh, kind of measurement for complexity but it's more like a, how stable is it how fast does it converge you know, something like this you wouldn't like so you, in this in this example it's called the the runge phenomena so um it's not important for this video but it's called the runge phenomena where you want to approximate this black curve here just a very simple curve using a polynomial that goes through certain points and this is just really ill behaved you can see that here the polynomial will do a lot of shit and then it's very good and then it will do a lot of shit okay that's kind of what you don't want in this process because in this example you would increase the order of the polynomial right, to get better results but the results are really good in the middle and really shit on the outside and the higher you do you make the order the shitter is the outside this is like a very bad thing for an iteration, right? Because for an iteration, you kind of want to make sure that you go closer to the solution and you can somehow just uh, kind of stop after step a million or whatever it is, right? Something like that. So kind of the question changes and this is what I kind of missed for years. So it's not a complexity type question anymore. It's more like a stability or convergence type question. And then it makes sense to think about algorithms for linear equations. Right? So even though this is fairly fast, if you really have large things, you might want to wonder. And the most famous ones, and there's a whole zoo of them, so I'm not really don't I really don't want to do them that much, uh, to discuss them that much, is those Kurloff subspace methods, and there's just a lot of them, and they are related to solving linear equations, like you can do eigenvectors or eigenvalues, which is essentially solving linear equations as well. And they usually have good convergence. Um, one of these methods, so, so let me just show you one of them. I guess I can find them Kurloff subspace and there should be, I don't need to spell by the way, there should be somewhere um, a Wikipedia page. Beautiful, so it doesn't matter and then it should tell me somewhere an example. Um, boop, 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 boop. There should be somewhere an example. This sounds good, an iteration. And hopefully there will be some animation that I can show you oh, a lot of pseudocode wonderful and blah 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 oh yeah an animation wonderful what do we see this is an anoldi iteration okay that's what it's called and it, it's uh, supposedly trying to approximate eigenvalues and what you see here are the eigenvalues of a 400 by 400 matrix and the iteration which runs okay I see the iteration runs here and you can literally see the red points converging to the black points and again the power of the iteration is right so it, there will be some nice statement of convergence and you can just run it as far as you want it to run and yeah maybe you're only interested in the eigenvalues on the outside and you can already um, can stop the calculation and this is an example of such a uh, such a curl of subspace subspace methods there are just many many more gradient descent in a certain way or form is also one of them um, and so on so that's why they rightly made it onto this list and although it took me a long time to understand why they actually rightly made it onto the list of the algorithms of the last century not of this century of the last century i think this goes back to kind of the 1930s where it all started with a russian mathematician called kurlov uh, by the way i would pr I probably pronounce this name completely wrong but um that's just what it is what can I do? I have no idea how to pronounce names. Anyway, I wish everyone would have a magic name where the pronunciation doesn't matter, right? Pronunciation is all the same. But anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.